Good morning, grade eight. Carrying on where we left with, left off with this topic of sexually transmitted infections. Okay, so the last thing that we need to go on to is HIV and AIDS. So HIV stands for Human Immunodeficiency Virus. And this is the virus that causes AIDS. Now, I know at one stage of the game, um, students were jam-packed full of information about HIV because it was taught in every possible way at every possible level of school. My impression is that you no longer get taught anything about it. And so um, I'm going to spend a little bit of time on this. Okay, so AIDS is acquired immune deficiency syndrome. And what it means is acquired means that a person can get um, infected with it. In other words, they can't, um, it's not a congenital thing like a heart defect that they that an individual is born with, etc. Immune deficiency means a weakness in the body's system that normally fights diseases. And syndrome means a group of health problems that makes up a disease. And this was the issue originally when the South African government at one stage was not prepared to admit that there was such a thing as HIV and AIDS, because what they said is these people are dying, but they're not all dying of the same thing. This person could be dying of pneumonia and that person is dying of tuberculosis. It's not the same thing. So it's obviously not caused by the same virus. And in reality, what it means is when a person has AIDS, the body system, immune system is so, so weak that any kind of infection that the body gets at that stage, um, the immune system can't get rid of it. And so any kind of disease could result in death at that stage. Okay. So let's talk about initial symptoms. Shortly after an, an individual becomes infected with HIV, initially what they show is flu-like symptoms. So they get fevers, chills, aches, pains, and things called swollen lymph nodes. Now, if you look at this photograph on the right side, this little, this is a swollen lymph node. People often call them glands. They're not actually glands. Um, when you get higher up in biology, you will learn about um, lymphatic system, and it's a lymph node. But please note, lymph nodes swell as a sign of many, many different infections, not just HIV. And so if an individual has swollen lymph nodes, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're infected with HIV. Okay, let's go back on the left here. So one of the initial um, symptoms that a person might show shortly after being infected with HIV is, is rashes, but they don't always do that. So let's have a look at the micrograph, electron micrograph of HIV. And this is a virus, virus highly, 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 highly magnified. Now, I know that you guys are seeing pictures of the coronavirus nowadays. So you might want to just compare the coronavirus micrographs with these micrographs that you're looking at now. Now, all viruses have got a capsid, and that's this little funny thing on the inside here, and that is made of protein. All viruses have got that. Then in addition to that, inside that, all viruses have some nucleic acid, some DNA or some RNA. And HIV has RNA nucleic acid. Okay. Then in addition to that, and this is so, so clever, HIV is just amazing. Um, it has an envelope. Now, not all viruses have an envelope. Only some viruses do. And HIV, this envelope, is a form almost like of camouflage. And I'll explain that to you when I explain how the virus 
is able to make other cells replicate copies of the virus. So what you're seeing here is you're seeing a capsid made of protein. What you can't see is inside that capsid is some nucleic acid. It's RNA, ribonucleic acid. In the case of HIV, we'll talk about that. Okay. So there's no vaccine against HIV. If I've got enough time, I'll possibly also talk about that. HIV is a huge field of interest in my life. Um, my master's degree is on HIV education, and I'm really, really interested in, in all the aspects of it. So I say to you that if a person becomes infected with HIV, it damages the body's immune system, and it increases the chances of contracting other viruses or bacteria, and also getting certain cancers. And these other infections that are, can occur are called opportunistic infections. Um, you don't have to know that term, units in blue, um, opportunistic infections are the other infections that occur when the body's immune system is so damaged by HIV that they can't fight off those infections. If left untreated, HIV infection will eventually lead to a situation where the body is said to have AIDS. Now, the rest of the world abbreviates AIDS in capital letters. In South Africa, they made it into an acronym, so it was capital A, small r, small d, small s. And I'm prepared to accept both. But please know, if you look at an overseas publication, it's CAPS. If you look at a South African publication, capital A and the rest of lowercase. So the World Health Organization and the Centers for Disease Control and um, Prevention have a very, very specific definition for the term AIDS. You don't have to worry about it. It's not the same as HIV. So a person who's infected with HIV hasn't necessarily got AIDS. AIDS is a situation after being infected with HIV for a very long time and not looking after oneself, it is possible to develop AIDS. But AIDS and HIV are not 100% the same thing. And then finally, when a person has developed AIDS, um, they can um, die prematurely. In other words, not die from old age. But fortunately, with today's treatment, many people living with HIV don't ever reach that stage of having AIDS. So while HIV cannot be cured, it is possible to suppress HIV to the extent that an individual will ne never develop AIDS. So this picture shows you the, a drawing of the micrograph that I showed you just now. So let's have a look. Here's the nucleic acid in the center, these two green wormy things. Please don't call them a green wormy thing in a test or exam. Okay, so there is the RNA, ribonucleic acid. Um, the virus also carries some enzymes with it. And here's the protein capsid. See, it's got this funny little shape. It's not um, a perfect oval. And that's what you saw when you looked here. You could see that shape, um, the non-perfect oval shape. Okay. So all viruses have a capsid. All viruses have nucleic acid. Nucleic acid in this case, I said to you, is RNA. And I'm fine with you not knowing the full term um, of ribonucleic acid here. I'm letting you just say RNA, capital R, capital N, capital A. Then in addition, HIV has something that not all viruses have, and that is an envelope. Okay, and we'll talk about the, the membrane envelope around the outside. 
But you know how when you look at the picture of the coronavirus, you always see some of these little surface spikes on it, which is the reason why the coronavirus is called the coronavirus, because in an electron micrograph, it looks like a crown. Now, HIV has similar spikes. They're not the same spikes. They're very specific for HIV, um, but they do have these spikes that enable them to attach to and enter specific cells. So, and this is in blue. The virus infects the cells of the body, and most commonly it infects those cells of the immune system that normally would fight an infection. And from that point on, every single cell that is infected functions almost like a factory. Don't say that in a test or exam. But every infected cell completely changes what it does. And all it does from then on is to produce and bud out new viruses. And those new viruses go on to infect more cells. So... Here is a micrograph of an HIV virus infecting a host cell. So this is a host cell. And the HIV virus is using those spikes on its surface to attach to a host cell. Once it's done that, it actually gets taken into the host cell and it breaks open and releases the RNA and the enzymes and the RNA then takes over the host cell and it makes the host cell do what the virus needs it to do from then on. So from then on, this RNA that has got into the host cell controls every single action of the host cell. And from then on, all the host cell does is produce new viruses, which then get butted out. So eventually, so many immune system cells are destroyed that the body can't fight infections anymore. And opportunistic infections become more and more common. And at that point, the individual is said to have AIDS. So let's have a look at some of the opportunistic infections that are characteristic of a person who has AIDS. Thrush, which is a fungal infection, either of the mouth and the throat or it can also be the vaginal thrush um, as i said it's a fungal infection having thrush does not mean that a person is hiv positive or even has aids so thrush is something that occurs naturally just like tuberculosis it's something that occurs um quite commonly in a population some parts of the population more than others because there are certain um, conditions that enable thrush and tuberculosis to spread more easily in certain um, conditions. So thrush, a fungal infection, tuberculosis you should know about. It's an infection mainly of the lungs, but tuberculosis can infect. It's a bacterial infection. It can infect other parts of the body as well. Then there's a kind of skin cancer, a very unusual kind of skin cancer, called Kaposi sarcoma. And here is a picture showing um, some lesions, some cancerous um, little patches on the skin surface of a person who has Kaposi sarcoma. Now, while these two are common amongst the general population, Kaposi sarcoma isn't. It's a very, very rare kind of cancer. And it started, it was one of the first things that doctors started to notice when HIV and the AIDS started to become more common in the populations in the late 1970s, early 1980s. Doctors started seeing a strange skin cancer that they hadn't seen before. And they started talking to each other about it. And then they started realizing that something was going on which wasn't um, normally seen by doctors. And it's the same kind of thing. This is not normal pneumonia. This is a pneumonia that used to, 
prior to HIV and AIDS, only be seen in birds, Nemesis carinia pneumonia, and um, again, like a sarcoma, doctors were talking about the fact that they were seeing this unusual pneumonia um, that they had never seen before in humans, and that they were seeing it pretty often. Okay, so how is HIV transmitted? So when um, I was telling you at this stage of the game, when a host cell um, becomes infected, it starts making new viruses. And those little viruses bud out of the host cell and they go into the fluids of the body. Um, they can infect other cells or they can go like into the blood, into saliva, into um, breast milk and semen and even vaginal fluids. And those fluids are called body fluids. A body fluid is any, any fluid of the body, um, any liquid within a body. And so HIV can go into the body fluids of an infected individual. And if there is enough um, viruses, if there are enough viruses in a body fluid, and a body fluid enters the body of an uninfected individual, then it is possible for the virus to be transmitted. Okay, now it's a little bit more complicated than this, and I will try and put in some um, time into explaining what I mean when I say this particular um, thing about enters the body of an uninfected individual. So, what I said to you is that the virus can go into any body fluids. However, for that body fluid to be infectious, pass on the infection to somebody else, it has to have a high enough viral load. So there have to be a certain minimum number of viruses to be able to infect another individual. So I said to you, that one of the viral, uh, one of the body fluids is saliva. Saliva never gets a high enough viral load. So even although there can be viruses in saliva, HR viruses in saliva in an infected individual, they're never enough to infect another individual. So it's an example of a body fluid with at a high enough viral load. However, certain body fluids that might have enough viral load to infect somebody else, if an individual is HIV positive, would be semen, very high viral load. Vaginal secretions, high viral load. Blood, very high viral load. Breast milk, high viral load. Okay. So what I've said to you is that HIV cannot be cured and there's no vaccine for HIV, but antiretroviral drugs, abbreviated as ALVs, are used to treat HIV infection. So what they can do is they fight HIV by stopping or interfering with the reproduction of the virus in the body. In other words, infected cells, if a person is on ARV medication, the infected cells, instead of turning up thousands and thousands of viruses per infected cell per day, um, the infected cells are unable to reproduce the virus as, as well as they do normally. Um, and a person who's on ARVs, who takes the ARVs correctly, might actually reduce their viral load, in other words, how many viruses there are in the medical blood, to undetectable. They're not cured, but they might not even be able to detect the virus in that person's body. Okay, so proper treatment with antiviral, antiretroviral medication slows the progress of the disease. It also, and this is terribly important, it lowers the possibility of transmitting HIV to a sexual partner. Because remember I said to you, 
but to be able to transmit it, the liquid, a body fluid must have a high enough viral load. So if a person's HIV positive and they're on ARVs and taking their medication correctly, the semen or vaginal secretions or blood or breast milk might have such a low viral load that they can't transmit HIV to another partner. Okay. So how can the fluids of an infected individual enter the body of an uninfected person? With unprotected, and remember I said to you that unprotected in this context means without the use of a male or female condom. So with unprotected vaginal, anal, or oral sex, and there I mean sex without using a male or female condom. Sharing of drug injection needles, blood to blood contact with an infected person, or mother to child transmission. So if a ma mother is uh, HIV positive while pregnant, she might pass it on to her child. It's this is not um, a common method of transmission. However, during the birth process, a mother might pass it on to the child, and this is more common than while pregnant. And the reason why is because there's some mixing of bloods um, during the birth process. And so, if a mother is HIV positive and has a caesarean section, there's much lower chance of transmission. And then, and this is a very sad one, when an HIV positive mother um, breastfeeds a baby who is HIV negative, it's possible to trans, um, to, for the, the baby to become infected. And for a long time, there was a lot of research done on whether it is better to um, rather feed that child formula rather than breast milk. Um, there were a lot of pros and there were a lot of cons with this. And then people started saying, well, you know, formula when possible, but breast milk when not possible. And that was actually found very interestingly to increase the risk of transmission having mixed a feeding formula sometimes, breast milk other times. And eventually, um, research showed breast milk is best, especially if the mother is on ARVs, and therefore the mother's viral load is reduced to very, very low levels. And then, obviously, drinking breast milk would be more effective. Okay. And that's the end of this section. And I think, judging from my calculations, by the time we start the next section, we're going to be back at school. Yay! Looking forward to seeing you guys.